It's a whiteout shutout for Penn State as they blank Iowa 31 to zip in a rather dominant performance. Once again, Tim Aiden, Patrick Kerber from BlackshedDiaries.com here to break it all down for you. Uh, Pat, uh, that that was just – we were talking about before I hit record, but it was almost like Penn State essentially was beating Iowa at its own game, at least from an offensive standpoint, with so many long, sustained drives that ended up finishing in the end zone. Yeah, I think for Penn State, right, going into this game, I mean – Yes, beating Iowa with their own game, but Penn State obviously, you know, scored more than what's Brian Ferentz's point total last said, 25 points a game, right? So Penn State, you know, outdoes Brian Ferentz as far as point wise. But yeah, it was I don't want to say what was expected, right? Because it was what the Penn State spread was 14 and a half. So they certainly, you know, doubled that. But kinda, you know, as as far as what you were hoping for for Penn State realistically speaking right every everybody obviously wants Penn State to go in and, and win easy but tough in the beginning I was a good defense made it tough made it sloppy but Penn State eventually prevails and, and like you said um defense big plays on uh special teams in particular short fields when the pretty sure that Penn State did end up winning the uh the the, the you know getting the ball in short field so yeah all in all a, a good game Absolutely. And, you know, like it, it did start out kind of slow. Um, you know, it was only three, nothing after the first quarter, 10, nothing at the half. Um, but actually I should point, uh, they had a nice stat on uh, CBS when they went into halftime, James Franklin was 41 and one at Penn state. will lead by 10 or more points at the half. He improves at 42 and one. Um, Pat, I'm sure you can probably guess what the one game was that, James Franklin lost when they were up by 10 or more at halftime. And we will, we won't need to rehash that one. Um, but just really, uh, even though on the scoreboard, it was close and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, you know, Penn State's just one. I mean, I was just one like defensive, you know, just one turnover, you know, one muff punt, you know, yeah, just Saunders special teams play. I mean, yeah, Caden Saunders really close call yeah. there, you know, late in this first half. Uh, you know, that, that could have really changed the trajectory of the ball game if, if he uh, doesn't fall back on his own muff punt. But you know, I'm thinking they at halftime, you know, it's it's obviously you like where Penn State was sitting up 10 nothing, but you wanted to see them just come out in the second half, go up 17 zip, and really put the Hawkeyes behind the eight ball uh, where they couldn't just rely on a single defensive play or, or, you know, special teams screw up by Penn state to foot, you know, to change the momentum. That's exactly what happened. You know, Penn state got the ball start second half. They methodically drive down the field. And, you know, as we mentioned before, um, I pulled up the drive charts here. So, Penn State's draw, so they all their scoring drives. Let's read them off to you. 17 plays, 78 yards, 728 off the clock. That was the field goal. 10 plays, 39 yards, 454. That was a touchdown to make it 10 0. And then to open the second half, they had 15 plays, 75 yard drive, eats up 640 of the clock for a touchdown. And then 12 plays, 56 yards, eating up 550 off the clock for another touchdown. They follow that up with an eight play 16 yard drive for eats up about three and a half minutes in a touchdown. That was off uh, Iowa f- a fumble recovery off Iowa, but uh, you can just see how they just had these uh, methodical drives. It was just a lot of short passes and a lot of just feeding Katron Allen and Nick Singleton, the rock. And, you know, once again, either though, even though none of them um, had like that, you know, 25 plus yard explosive play. I mean, they were, they really did it. Penn State really did a good job of just ultimately wearing down that Iowa defense. I mean, just by virtue of really Penn State's defense continually just getting pressure on Cade McNamara, just swallowing up that run game. Uh, you know, that run game never really seemed to have much of a chance. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, get forcing four fumbles, which they recovered. Uh, four, well, actually, four, six fumbles. Uh, I, you know, Penn State recovered four of them. 
But, you know, the defense really just helps set up the offense nicely to just wear down a gas Iowa defense. And, and of course, we haven't even gotten into Drew Aller, who you look at the stat line, it's scrolling down at the bottom right now. Uh, you know, 27, 166 yards and four touchdowns. I mean, if that hasn't screamed like dinking and dunking to you, I don't know what does. But you know what? Credit to Drew. He did not try to force any deep balls. I know there's a lot of complaints from people, and I know friends and some of my group chats are complaining, why aren't we taking any downfield shots? And, you know, I was hoping to see some of those too, but I feel like it's hard to see on the broadcast at least, but my guess is Iowa was, I don't want to say selling out, but they were really focused on not allowing Drew Hour to burn them with, with, with bombs and just, you know, hoping that Drew would actually get impatient enough to try some bombs and then, that's when like Cooper DeJean or someone in their secondary would take advantage and get an interception. But, you know, credit to Drew, he took what the defense gave him. So it was just a lot of short, medium range passes to the sideline or, you know, slants over the middle, uh, you know, just pats off to him. And man, when he had to deliver in the red zone, you know, I, I lost count how many third and goal situations there were. He freaking delivered, man. Actually, I think he delivered on a, it was a fourth and goal in Penn State opted to go for it. And, you know, he just threw a dart to Khalil Dinkins. I put him up 10 zip. I, that's one that sticks out to me. But um, he just did a – just very poised. I mean, after, you know, last week he looked a little more human. Uh, you know, this week we saw a little more of the Drew Hour we saw in the first two games. Would you agree with that, Pat? Yeah, and I and I think overall for the offense, obviously, like you kind of mentioned before, um, a lot of those longer play drives were coming in the second half as they kind of wore Iowa's defense down. Um, it's one of those games that you look at the box score, right? If you look at Drew's numbers, 25 to 37 for 166 yards, right? Only 4.5 yards. Um, Kedron Allen, 21 carries for 72 yards, 3.4 yards as an average. Nicholas Singleton, 17 carries for 49 yards. 2.9 yards per per carry um, longest passing play for drew was 14 yards to Kendrick Andre Lambert Smith. Right. So if you kind of read this before the game or you didn't watch the game, you would think that the offense struggled mightily and granted it was not a perfect offensive game, but overall it felt decently efficient, especially as they got into the second half, obviously Penn state had a couple of those first half drives that stalled out went three and out, you know, they, they were going backwards at times. So certainly don't want to act like that. It was you know perfect the entire game because this was probably, I would say the first game that I was a little bit worried about, especially, you know, once again, in the first half when Penn State's up 10, nothing um, and just kind of was struggling, couldn't pull away, but obviously Penn State did get the job done, but I thought, you know, overall pretty good showing, especially when you consider the, it was one, I think more, you know, we knew that it was going to rain going into the game, but it seemed like it rained more than people expected. Secondly, especially as the game wears on, right? So I was first to offensive drives or the second offensive drive. That's when they ended up fumbling. But prior to that, they were moving the ball decently or they had pretty good field, field position to start with. But other than that, right, it became very clear that Penn State's defense was you know, going to be able to contain them and that they would have trouble scoring. So Penn State goes up 10 nothing with like 10 minutes left in the first, in the second quarter. And I think, once again, I don't want to say that they're holding anything back, but I think that your church was definitely like, let's not go too aggressive here, right, with trying to, you know, go deep on first and 10 or throwing up 50-50 balls where, you know, Cooper DeJohn can, you know, pick off a pass. Because it really did feel like the type of game that as long as Penn State's offense and special teams just doesn't make a mistake, don't fumble the ball. Don't give Iowa a short field. Don't give up an interception. Don't muff upon Caden Saunders. That it would be really difficult for Iowa to string together the drives to be able to to score points um, multiple times. So, not trying to make excuses for the offense because you definitely would like the you you know a big play here or there. Once again, another offensive day without twenty plus yard plays. Kind of once again, just waving the little flag here. I'm like slightly concerning. We can say that. My voice gets high because I'm nervous. But all in all, I, I cannot complain. Penn State wins 31 nothing against a good Iowa, pretty good Iowa team. I don't want to say a good Iowa team because 
man, offensively, Brian Ferentz, Dan McNamara, don't know if that is working out for you. But, yeah, let's – uh, what do you want to talk about? Should we talk more about Drew or should we talk more about the defense? Because I think that's kind of the takeaway – the major takeaway from today, just that Drew had, despite the fact that it were gaudy passing stats, at least yardage wise, had a really, really nice day. And like you said, looked more like um, the Drew that we all know and love more so than last week. Or do you want to talk about the defense that, you know, completely suffocated Iowa? I feel like we can, I feel like we can do both at the same time. But before we do that, Pat, just want a couple pitches here. Uh, Mark Rogers himself from the voice of college football is currently doing his call-in show. So after done watching Pat and I break this game down for you, you can head on over, maybe give your hot take on this game or anything else in your mind. You can go talk to him. Also, we have our Discord channel here, the voice of college football. Go to our Patreon, search Mark Rogers TV. And also, uh, while we're at it, BoxerDiaries.com, uh, your one-stop shop for Penn State Sports coverage, um, Pat. You're you're gonna have your you you have like a breakdown, I think, or you do three takeaways. Remind me which posts you do, but uh, I'll have my position yeah. grades up sometime yeah. tomorrow. So keep during the week, I'll have random thoughts. So I'll have random thoughts, um, and then stock up, stock down. It's just more of a broad college football look ahead on on Wednesday or Thursday. But on Tuesday, we will have random thoughts on the game. So I'll rewatch the game. Just write down my thoughts as they as they pop in my head. Um, certainly, we'll be talking about Jura Lord and the defense a lot, though. So, you look forward to that. And, yeah. In addition to position grades, I'll also have a turning point um, segment up on Monday, which will highlight a maybe a, a moment in the game where the momentum permanently shifted in one team's favor. So, keep an eye out for that as well, as well as other great posts we'll have, like post game link dumps. Uh, we'll have a plethora of posts going up tomorrow for certain. So, keep an eye out there. And, of course, uh, it's September right now, but before you know it, we'll be in uh, college basketball season, wrestling season, uh, hockey. Uh, we'll, we have plenty of great writers covering that at blackstrides.com, so uh, you check us out all year long for that coverage. And I want to uh, say hello to everyone watching us currently on blackstrides.com. We post a link to this YouTube show on there now, so you want to check us out on there. Um, just a shout out to everyone who's shown up in the chat. Uh, see several of you talking about the Ohio State at Notre Dame win. Maybe we'll touch on that briefly later on. Uh, and also, uh, shout out uh, Ian from Australia. Loves college football. Have you seen Australian rules football? Um, I've watched clips, Ian. I've never watched. I'm aware of it. I know. I, I've I never watched a full match, but I've seen clips of it. It's I heard of the concept. It's, it's more a concept in my mind than a real thing. I know you all turn out uh, putters here for college football. So, um, or is that rugby? Now I'm getting mixed up. Well, Aussie rules, rules is a mix of it's a mix of like rugby. It's, so it's rugby, but you can throw forward passes essentially. So it's like I don't know. Maybe, maybe Ian can. Uh, I feel like they're stealing football from us. I don't know about Ian, this. Ian can explain it to us. I'm sure. Uh, shout out to our old pal Marty Leap. Uh, wonders of Lavar Woods. That's Iowa special teams corner is flopping around the sideline like a toddler tonight. Um, yeah, in reference to uh, a couple of years ago when, you know, Penn State's players were getting injured, Iowa's fans were booing, and even uh, one of the assistants that Iowa was getting, was getting in on the action by mimicking a flop on the side. Do we have any uh, any injuries to on the other side, by the way? It just popped up now. I'm thinking, no. Are there any so real, I don't think there were any real injuries on the other side. I mean, yeah. King McNamara seemed to take a couple of good shots. Um, they have to stop play at any point, though. I don't think. No, I don't. It was pretty, pretty, pretty crazy that Penn State's defense. Quickly. I mean, with the new clock rules, plus, you know, yeah. lack of injuries. And, you know, I think CBS didn't go to commercial too often, not like watching a Fox broadcast at least. So it uh, it seemed to go by rather quickly. It was done, I think, in like three hours. How was Penn State's defense able to hold Iowa to zero points if they didn't fake any injuries, though? That might well, be. It's, uh, it's a mystery to me, Pat. You know, uh, crazy that we yeah, didn't have those, to... those Brian Ferentz offenses are just so. Uh, I guess uh, you know, you know what? what Penn State we we fake injuries after first downs, and Iowa only had only had three <laughs> of oh, four. They got to four and at the end, so we didn't really have that many opportunities. We'll have to do it. I don't think we play. I don't think we play Iowa next year. Maybe we do. I guess I have to change the schedule anyway. 
Yeah, who knows? We don't know what the schedule is going to look like. The way now with Oregon, Washington, when they're going to have to redo what they had released, um, you know, a couple months ago. But we'll see. I, I don't know when they're going to play Iowa next. And well, frankly, I'm fine if we don't play them for a couple more years. We can savor this win a bit more. <laughs> but yeah, we, we want to talk about shoot. What's about the defense? I mean, we talked about Drew a little bit. Defense and and uh, how they held uh, Kate McNamara in check. Uh, I don't Can know about start- you. Can we start this with the the preface that I was offense is bad. We get that. We're going to do a bit of a victory lap for the Penn State defense. Yes, I was offense is bad though. Just to just to uh to kind of, I guess that's kind of the discussion point that we can start off with. How much of tonight is about Penn State's defense versus how much of tonight was about Iowa's offense, right? Cuz Iowa's offense is not good. Penn State's defense, yeah. we do know is good, but where is that happy medium of of what was stronger tonight. I'm going to let you answer that. I, mean, I think Penn State's deep. I mean, look, you hold any, I don't care how bad Iowa's offense is or how much Brian Ferentz sucks as a coordinator. When you hold a team to 79 total yards of offense, your defense freaking balled out, man. That That's, that's my takeaway. And I don't know about you, Pat, but I was getting real sick and tired going into this game of hearing about, how Cade McNamara lit up Penn State. Cade McNamara and Eric all lit up Penn State two years ago, playing for Michigan. Like, they're not playing on Michigan. Yeah. They're not surrounded by four- and five-star talent. This is a far better Penn State team they're facing than two years ago. Different defensive coordinator, loves to bring the heat. And I, you know, I'm not trying to disparage Brent Pry here. He was a fine coordinator himself. But this is a completely different Penn State team than the one – they were faced that McNamara and all faced when they were wearing maize and blue uniforms. So I, I really enjoyed how McNamara just sucked tonight. Five, five of 14, 42 <laughs> yards. I mean, I think his, I mean, his best moments were like the very beginning of the game. If he threw like a, I think half of those passing yards he got in just one play in the first drive, like a 20 yard strike to Eric all. And uh, in fairness, they did have a promise. I think it was their second drive. Looked very promising. He had a first down pass to Eric All uh, into the red zone. You know, and All was trying to push for an extra yard or two, getting a little greedy. And, uh, you know, Penn State strips the ball. I think it was Curtis Jacobs who got it and stripped the ball from it him. It was uh, Deny Dennis Sun's knee. Really weird looking oh. play because, yeah, Jacobs goes in there I with his the Jacobs stripped it from him in the broadcast. Deny Dennis Sun is- went in there and punched it, but then on the he misses the punch. The ball's going on Eric Hall's <laughs> hand that had the ball was going down and it hits the ninth Dennis Sun's knee. So definitely but, gets know, credit. Kudos, but, kudos yeah. to I mean I mean I'm sure Manny's teaching them to do that in practice. So you know when the when the guys the ball carrier is trying to get that extra yard, you just reach oh. in there and punch it. Johnny Dixon. Hand. Johnny Dixon doesn't even believe in tackling. He is simply out there just to punch <laughs> the ball. If Johnny Dixon De- Johnny is like, why do I need to tackle the guy? I can just punch the ball. So yeah, they're clearly clearly teaching that very well. And Johnny Dixon listens to that part. Does not listen to the tackling part. But anyway, sorry. But you know, that you know that uh that that ref- natural reflexes seem to pay off because they stripped the ball from him and recover that Iowa never got close to the red zone again, it seemed uh, they were just constantly going actually you know what we'll, we'll, we'll pull up the uh should i read after the fumble i can read you iowa's uh, oh i got it i gotta pull it up but yes for our viewers please go ahead read it off to uh not to copy dan rubenstein the solid verbal we don't have the the jaws music but punt 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 fumble punt fumble beautiful <laughs> stuff beautiful it's just stuff. yeah just an a- absolute beauty to to look at if you love defense um but yeah uh i mean again i think it i think it's more so i mean again i i was offense is bad don't get it twisted but to be 79 yards bad you got to be going up against a really good defense like and dare i say a championship caliber defense like penn states to get less than 100 total yards of offense so i i have a feeling they're going to be a little more prolific next weekend when they host Michigan state, a team that's already seen to mail it in on their season after all that's going on there. 
Yeah, no, it, right. We just read that off the punts and the fumbles, but it was th uh, three plays for Iowa, 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 one play for Iowa, three plays for Iowa, five plays for Iowa. So, and that's yeah, key because that that wore that wore out their defense. I mean, you're constantly going yeah. three and out, and your defense constantly going back in the field. It doesn't matter how good they might have been. You notice early on they were able to kind of contain Allen and Singleton. As the game wore on, I mean, Catron was picking up these nice, like, five to seven yard chunks every time he touched the ball. And they were able to get stuff up the middle, off tackle. I mean, you know, they were clearly getting gassed in the second half, which I think was the idea all along with the play calling. But, uh, you know, it, it seemed to work to a T. Uh, you know, hopefully down the line, we'll see some. Nice deep shots from Drew, perhaps as soon as next week at Northwestern, uh, who, uh, by the way, pulled off an incredible comeback at home against Minnesota. They were down by 21 points going to the fourth quarter and came back, forced overtime, went in overtime, 37-34. Uh, kudos to David Braun for getting his first um, FBS win as a coach. That's, or no, sorry, not a bit. First Big Ten win. Uh, he already beat UTEP. Um, so he barely, barely FCS, but yes, FCS, <laughs> yes, FCS, right? barely FCS. But, but uh, so yeah, maybe uh, you know Northwestern feeling their oats a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm sure they'll be playing a little bit more confidence when Penn State goes to visit them next week. Although I still anticipate Penn State should win that one without too much trouble. And then, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you still want to talk about uh, this Iowa game? I mean, we can talk a little bit, actually. Uh, I think one thing I want to yeah. touch we on. We barely even reached the surface when it comes to Drew. You you can't come on here and think that <laughs> I'm going to spend like three minutes on Drew. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's it. Come on. Well, before we talk more about Drew, though, I think we want to talk a bit about the receivers. Um, you know, Kendall yes. Smith. We can't give him credit. Had a good also, game. Also, Leo Johnson, six receptions. Finally. Finally, it was used yeah. a little bit to get any touchdowns, but they were Theo in, but, and K T Tyler Warren, Khalil Dinkins. They caught a few touchdowns between them. Um, so you know, can Tyler I just talk about Drew first? Involved. Let me talk about Drew, and then you can you can kind of come on in and let me know about the wide receivers. But just the best guy in the world. Um, here's the thing with quarterbacks, like. You know, you have all these QB gurus on, you know, Twitter, and when these guys are coming out with four and five star prospects, it's like, oh, look at this throwing motion, and the ball, you know, comes out of his hand, and blah 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 blah, and mindset and leadership. At the end of the day, with a quarterback, you watch it, and it's like, you know it when you see it. Like I don't, I don't need stats to tell me that a quarterback's good. I don't need to know about the exit velocity or the amount of spiral rotations or whatever. I can just watch quarterback and you know, you know, it when you see it, you know, a good quarterback when you see it and drew a right. Despite the fact that, you know, I don't know what his QBR is quarterback rating is going to be when this all comes up. It's probably not going to be that high because he threw 37 times and only had 166 yards. But even with the weather, even with, you know, a, what is I'm sure still going to be a really good Iowa defense and it is a good Iowa defense. Even as we saw tonight, he just makes plays and he makes them when Penn state, Penn State needs them the most. So many times Penn State was nine of twenty on third down and and four of four on fourth down. By the way, we got a bunch of tush pushes, which I appreciate. I called for. Um Penn State was fortunate on one of them to get a good spot because I don't think Drew actually got the first down, but he's just good. Like the how he reacts when he's under pressure. There were a couple of times tonight that his his, his footwork was a little sloppy and kind of you know didn't didn't uh navigate the pocket the right way but he's usually just so good calm cool collect it you know finds his wide receiver where he needs to finds the open man just he's just good like that's and that's that all that's all it comes down to with quarterbacks and that's like the thing with Ohio State for all these years that's like they just get these guys that's like oh yeah that guy's good oh yeah next guy's good and I mean we can talk about it. I didn't I honestly didn't really watch much of the Ohio State game tonight just because Penn State was on and, and what Kyle McCord is or isn't but it's just it's nice for Penn State that Drew is good because he is. He played Iowa and he did not have a turnover. He didn't have a fumble tonight in the rain. He did not have an interception. 
I don't even think he really had any that were even close to being intercepted. His ball does get bad at quite a bit by the defensive line, which is a little weird because he's 6'5", but he's just really, really good. And he also had a lot of help from his receivers and his tight ends tonight because after, you know, kind of a so-so game last week against Illinois, they were much better. So who was kind of leading us uh, at wide receiver, Tim? Well, Count Lambert Smith, uh, eight catches, six, six yards and a touchdown. But after that, it's it's kind of quiet. I mean, Liam Clifford had a nice uh, – had a couple catch, – two catches, 17 yards, had a nice catch to get a first down. Uh, and then Dante Cephas, he had a couple catches uh, for 11 yards, did get a first down off one of them. Uh, but, you know, uh, Trey Wallace supposedly was going to be – was going to play tonight. Uh, apparently hit, um, Steve Jones, who does the radio play-by-play, had talked to his – mom on the pregame show and she said that he was going to play tonight i know he's listed as questionable on the injury report but i believe he was in on who dropped a pass early i'm trying to think was it lambert smith oh not drop a pass sorry when lambert smith got called for the face mask i believe they told oh yeah that that uh yeah that and Trey Wall, I believe trey wallace came in i might be wrong on that but i think he did come in and i was probably once again, this is all guessing on my part that it's probably like a hamstring or like a groin pull or something like that. And as it started getting wetter and wetter and the fields became, you know, tougher to play, my guess is that maybe they were like, eh, this is probably not the game to to come back from, especially when, yes, Northwestern beat Minnesota, but right, you have Northwestern to buy and UMass coming up. Um, Penn State probably thought, eh, we can probably get away with, with not playing Trey, but. That's just a guess on my part, but I do believe he played a little bit. Maybe, maybe. Okay, maybe I didn't was. notice. Um, I guess he we'll, did. We'll, we'll see. In, we'll see in the snap counts. Uh, yeah. How much he played, um, but you know, I guess the one, the one thing of concern I have, or one of the concerns I have going forward, does uh, you know they need a number two receiver to step up, and I mean it's great the tight ends were very involved. It was good to see them step up, but I would love to see a clear cut number two guy at wide receiver who uh, drew can rely on step up as well. Um, And I guess the other thing is, of course you want to, you would love to see Nick or Catron just bust a huge gain um, more than they've been doing now, but you know, they were efficient tonight overall. So I can't complain too much about that. Uh, But you know, it's a little weird. Like there's, because the defense, I mean, I I can sleep like a baby over the defense. And special teams, which probably was maybe the biggest concern for me going into the season, I, I feel like that's been mostly resolved, especially the kicking game, because we were very – that seemed to be very shaky for against West Virginia. But Alex Falcons, uh, you know, stepped up nicely. Uh, you know, he, he had a field goal tonight. I know he missed one. Later on, but it was a trivial miss because Penn State had 31 zip. And he, know, missed, no, he missed the right one and made the right one. Yeah, he missed the right one. Yeah. It's you know, no one's gonna be perfect at kicking folks. So like uh they're gonna miss every now and then. It's better that he misses one when the game's already in hand. So he'll make one when he absolutely has to. That's that's what you want in your kicker, really. Makes the ones he absolutely needs to. So and again the Wosu putting those kickoffs in the end zone. Got no complaints there. I'd like to see I mean, I don't know what's up with uh, the punting game. It's just, I mean, you know, Riley Thompson, you like to see someone who can really boom those better. Um, Yeah, I think the unfortunate thing with him, he was at, if I remember correctly, FAU last year, Florida Atlantic, and his average was like 45 yards. But from what I understand, because he's that rugby style, a lot of those 45 yarders were just ones that bounced and kind of, you know, inflated his average a little bit that he doesn't i think it's pretty clear that he doesn't have the strongest leg um i think yeah it's something that could come back to bite them i mean i uh, it's tough it's 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 tough to say but i think overall he's he's fine like he's fine i i just don't think he has the leg to even boom it it's just a little disappointed that alex pachetta who went to the same high school as blake gillikin is now, I believe, in the second season at Penn State, and was a big time recruit as far as far as uh, punters go. That he doesn't have the consistency, and same with uh, Game Nuusu, who's also a punter. That he doesn't have the consistency because I think those guys have a little bit more of a leg 
Riley's a little bit more. Riley Thompson's a little bit more consistent. Um, and Penn State's obviously going with that consistency. But, you know, hopefully you're not leaning on your punter to have 60, 70 yard punts or, you know, 50, 60 yard punts. But, right. But it makes me wonder what's up with, I mean, Alex Bachetta is a scholarship punter and he's yeah. probably third on the depth chart but to- behind Gabe Nwosu and Thompson. So, I mean, it's, it, it's a little concerning. You would hope a scholarship punter would at least be the backup or be pushing Riley. Um, this Franklin has weirdly had some misses at kicker and punter. When you look, Gilligan obviously a big hit, um, but I mean Sander Zahedek not exactly lighting it up at kicker. He's a scholarship. I think the guy way they rank these kickers and punters is kind of hit or miss as well. Because I mean, it is. There's a lot of random. Shadow was an yeah. operator punter coming out of high school. Yeah, but even right, they get lucky with Jordan Stout. I shouldn't say lucky with Jordan Stout, but right, they need to go in the transfer portal get Jordan Stout because they missed on Alex Barber, who was who was a kicker ended up at Liberty um, after they missed on Quinn Dean. Uh, yeah, so just we'll see what happens over time. Maybe those guys eventually Zahedek and uh, Bachetta eventually get it going. But yeah, I mean for this year, Falcons, you know, just make some 40 yarders here or there, right? He made that 46 yarder when Penn state kind of needed him to make it just to, yeah. you know, keep the momentum or to give Penn state some momentum. Cause that was the first points of the game. Um, and yeah, I think Thompson will be, will be hopefully decent, decent enough, but, uh, well, you say hopefully we'll have to be relying on Thompson to be booming yeah. punts for us anyway. Our offense will be moving the ball well enough to not have to do such things. Uh, yeah, you know, I think, uh, I kind of want to just <laughs> go over some of these team stats here because this is just eye popping. Uh, first downs, most notably, let's say the 28 of them to Iowa's four. That's right. I went four first downs the entire game. And actually, there was a funny tweet from uh, Bud Elliott from CBS Sports. Uh, he had one, which Iowa first down did you like the best? It was a poll, just the first one, the second one. And that was prior to because Iowa got to their the two last first downs when the second team. Yeah, I mean, I was you know, yeah, you know, before the backups were all in. Um, but yes, Iowa one and nine on third down conversions. Penn State was nine to twenty. Uh, actually, speaking of conversion, Penn State they won for it on fourth down four separate times tonight, converted all four times. I mean, it's the only thing too. I think we didn't touch it, but the it, it, we were very aggressive. Penn State very aggressive on fourth down calls. Um, which I really appreciated. You know, they especially I think the first touchdown strike, it was like fourth and one, fourth and two, and you know, you're in you're it's a chip shot field goal, but at the same time, you're really looking for some kind of I won't call it a kill shot, but you're looking for some real momentum shifter by getting a touchdown. And and even if you don't get it, you know what? I always gotta start inside their own 10 so your defense can maybe you know, forcing a punt from their own end zone or even get a turnover. But, you know, I, I just love the aggressiveness out of uh, the coaching staff when it came to going for it on fourth down. Yeah, no, so did I. And even that first touchdown, which he hit the third string tight end, Khalid Dinkins um, in the end zone. Once again, as I always say, and I can't believe I made it almost 35 minutes into it, I need to go back and watch the game because we watch this once, then we come out here and we have to give our takes, which I don't necessarily love doing. But I don't even think Dinkins was – he definitely was, Yeah, that, that is the beauty of it. I mean, think Dinkins for sure was not the first, the first read on that. I believe it was – I think it was play action. I think they wanted to hit either Warren or Johnson. I don't remember who it was. I want to say it was a tight end um, in the flat. Iowa took that away and – once again, going back to the, the the Drew compliments that I that I gave him, where it's like you know when you see it, it's just simple, not simple things, but you make really hard plays look simple. And that pass to Dinkins was one of them. That he's fourth and one, calm, cool, and collected. Right, his first read is taken away. He steps on the pocket, changes his eyes, finds a, an open receiver. But even if you watch that play, Dinkins not a wide open pass. It's not super easy. He just fires it in there and, and hits them. So, once again, everything comes back to uh, Drew Lore, who is now that Sam Hartman, loser, uh, <laughs> no longer in the Heisman race. I think uh, Drew Lore is high up there. But uh, no, it was a nice, nice game for 
just the offense in general. And yeah, like you said, they were aggressive enough and they were aggressive in the right situations. Um, like you said, going for it four different times on fourth down, getting it all four times. Once again, one of them, thanks to a fortunate spot from, from the refs, but um, much to Gary Danielson's dislike. <laughs> I'm not a big, like care about the commentators, but Gary Danielson definitely seemed to uh, be a little anti Penn state tonight. That's all I'll say. But um yeah, I liked the uh, overall liked what the offense did. And even even at halftime when it was ten nothing, I it was once again the situation of like you want them to be a little bit more aggressive, but yet what they're doing is like it's working enough, right? At Penn State, Penn State's up ten nothing at half. If they come in the second half and they do that again, that's you know a three touchdown win. So you can't you can't complain too much. So yeah, good game, definitely a good game. Yeah, uh, I don't know what else. I guess I can say about this i mean just a completely dominating performance um you know i guess it is fun it was funny i, I don't do you i don't know if you like look at message boards or comment sections all during the games but no i just want to over at the lions 24 7 I, I value my brain too much to, it's kind of uh, it's kind of hysterical to see like how yeah. apocalyptic some people get in there to start a game when it's slow and especially only three nothing and everyone's crapping on Mike Yersich, his play calling. And, you know, and I'm kind of curious to go back in there now and just see like, like what it looks like. You know, people kind of, uh, people need to understand uh football game is not, is not 15 minutes long. It's 60 minutes. Um, you know, Penn is the kind of team that, uh, yeah, I guess dare I say, you know, I'll take a term that's solid verbal loves to use crock pots you from yeah. what I've seen so far, you know, they may not, you might come out of the gate and, and you know light you up right away, but they will gradually wear you down. And at the end of the game, you know, it ends up being a, a comfortable enough victory. So uh just a very satisfying win overall. It's actually the first time I was been shut out uh since the year two thousand. Uh fun it's Pretty crazy. Game. Pretty impressive. That is. I didn't think they won went that long without getting shut out. So I mean it really puts again, I think, you know. I give I think the the I put more onus on the defense balling out as opposed to Iowa's offense sucking. I mean just being sucky in general. Uh, another fun fact, Penn State's now gone 28 consecutive quarters of scoring of some kind. So uh that's like seven whole games worth basically at this point. So good on Penn State. Hopefully they keep that streak going next week at Northwestern. Um I have two trivia questions for you. All right. Good. I was going to say, you got some trivia questions for me, Pat? Of course. At the end of, the show. of course I do. Didn't have anything last week, so I need to come back. <laughs> uh, Penn State's last uh, shutout was? Shutout win? Shutout. Yes, shutout win. Yes. <laughs> Game that they oh, won. Okay. Um, it was two years ago. They beat Indiana. It was like 24 zip. There was a game, another game in 2021. That they oh the them. Rutgers yes. game where half the team was out with the flu yes, and you figure if Rutgers is gonna win that might be the time to do it but nope they blank them in yes. that one too Rutgers twenty twenty one I don't have the score in front of me but I believe I remember that was twenty eight nothing I want to say I think it was twenty yeah I think it was twenty eight zip I'm pretty sure you know what I yeah can, Indi- Indiana I was twenty four nothing so I believe that one was twenty eight nothing that's uh, the one second- I remember more. but yeah twenty eight nothing I just looked it up yeah, yeah. second one. Don't be looking at the box score. Who led Penn State in tackles tonight? And how many do you think they had? Keep in mind that uh, Iowa's leading tackler had 18 tackles. Oh. Which is good and bad because if you, that means you're on the field a lot, which is not good for defense. But what do we think Penn State had? Okay, leading tackler, I'm going to say it was – I'm going to say it was Curtis Jacobs with seven. Was Curtis Jacobs and Abdul Carter both had three? Not the <laughs> team. Okay. But that's that's kind of the point, right? It's and it's twofold. One, Iowa just didn't have that many offensive plays. Penn State as a team only had 24 tackles because again, I was not on the field a whole lot to be tackled. Um, but secondly, this is always I mean, I don't want to say it's always the case with defenses, but right, it's like football very much so. A lot of people, it's a team game. But they're really right. If you think about tonight, it's like, oh, who defensively was like the most dominant? 
I think Chop Robinson, right? If we had to like name one person who would probably have the best game defensively, I, I think it's probably going to be Chop Robinson if he graded out. And it's good that he was able to get a sack and a, and a strip sack. He's definitely deserved to get one of these. But just so many people played well. Like that, it was just a complete dominant effort from the defensive line to the defensive tackles, the linebackers, the safeties, the cornerback. Very complimentary uh, football. And just, again, points to how good and deep this defense is that they can, you know, shut Iowa out. And yet there's, I don't want to say not gaudy stats because they did, they obviously played very well, but right. Three sacks, five tackles for loss. I mean, the, the four fumbles definitely help, but um, just a really good team, just a very good team. And I think that, you know, I don't know how many Penn State fans are larger college football fans and are watching other teams, but Everyone kind of stinks in their own way this year. And Penn State, I'm not saying that Penn State's the best team, but when you look at the completeness of teams around the country, it feels like Penn State's right up there where they have a really, really, really good defense, you know, perhaps even an elite defense, and an offense that I still think, yes, they have another level to get to, but I think I shouldn't. They are good enough and, and you know, will continue to grow and get better. Um, so yeah, just just a great night. Yeah, and the beauty of it now is, I mean, you basically have three week three weeks to get ready for Ohio State. I mean, not to disrespect Northwestern, UMass, or the bye week too much, but uh, you know, those are all things uh, Penn State should be able to handle without too much trouble. You know, and I know Northwestern, they're definitely going to be fired up after that win over Minnesota. Uh, you know, so they'll. I'm sure they'll come out swinging against Penn State, but you know they're going to find out very quickly that Penn State is not Minnesota. And so, but uh, yeah, it's and you saw what Ohio State. Did. I guess we can touch maybe just before we go, we can just do a I was going to say we go around the Big country. Ten. Yeah, so obviously the game that was going on at the same time as Penn State was Ohio State in North in Notre Dame, and uh, man, what a finish! I actually had this one streaming on my laptop. Uh, so I was watching both games at once, but man, that, that was a real, that was a bigger defensive struggle than Penn State, Iowa. I was like three, nothing Ohio State at the half. And, but man, those last, like that, that last drive, my it was 14, 10 Notre Dame. And I think Notre Dame dropped interception at one point. Uh, oh, they, yeah. They, I think they had a, they had them in fourth down a couple times, and both times Ohio State converts and they get down right around like the one yard line. They have basically one. I think they're out of timeouts because they they got an intentional grounding penalty. And had to burn their final timeout to avoid a ten second runoff. So they have one. You know, no timeouts left. Like seven seconds left. What do they do? They hand it off straight up the gut and pounded in for the winning score. Uh, really a gutsy call right there. Against and, 10 Notre Dame defenders, as, as yeah, we As you mentioned, I, I didn't realize that from watching it, but uh, yeah, I guess that would explain though why there are only maybe like two guys on the one side of the field where Ohio State ran it at. So, man, what a yeah, big win for uh, the Buckeyes and uh, – Ryan Day was pretty fired up in his post game pre- or in the post game interview at midfield. Yeah. Like, he's you know, yelling, he's, he's going to drop an F bomb on live TV with the way he was fired up. Um, yeah, just screaming about Lou Holtz, which I don't, I don't necessarily care for Lou Holtz, but it's like, I don't know. Lou Holtz is like 88, probably. Pick on, I don't know if we should be yelling at some old guy that's probably a little crazy anyway. But yeah, that last drive for Ohio uh, State. 15 plays, 65 yards in a minute 25, which is just like a, a very weird time frame in, in general, right? To score in a minute 25, but go 15 plays. They convert on third and 10. They convert on fourth and seven. They convert on third and 19. And then, like you said, they uh, get in on third and goal from the Notre Dame one yard line where Notre Dame only had 10 defenders on the field. And Marcus Freeman. Um, so they could not get a defender on the field because they want to get a penalty flag, which you know would have gave Ohio State an extra yard. So I feel like if Marcus Freeman had that one back, might have 
Ram have redone that again. I don't know. Did did Notre Dame not have a timeout left? I mean, uh, I again, don't. I would have to watch the watch. Yeah, the, like the I'm just thinking now. Game. Like, why not take a? I thought they had one last. Maybe, been, maybe they were out of the timeout. I, I'm not sure to be. I, I'd have to look at the. Yeah. Uh, yeah if you, like I said, if they had ten men, they they, you know, they could have just burned a timeout to make sure they had eleven guys there. Ready to yeah. But. It, weird game though just again like i had it on the second tv but can't say i was was really paying attention too hard to it but just a weird su- such a weird ohio state team and, and i do definitely want to give Notre Dame credit because i think i think Notre Dame's very good i do think i do think they're very good they have a good defense they're able to run the ball sam Hartman's obviously one of the better quarterbacks in the country so i don't think that this is um the last that we'll see of notre dame as far as being in the college football playoff conversation Although I do believe they go to Duke next week, which I don't know what that line is going to be, but I will say I will hammer Duke plus whatever it is because that this just feels like a bit of a, not saying that they're able to lose, but definitely feels like a bit of a letdown spot. And Duke is a good team that you do not want to have to uh, come in coming off, you know, just an absolute crush of a loss like this. I mean, this is like Penn State 2017, Penn State 2018 against Ohio State level loss. If not, honestly, even worse. The fact that it was down to, that absolute last play, but yeah, just a weird, weird game. Just not a normal Ohio State team to win 17 to 14. And I guess, yeah, you give as Ryan Day was screaming about against Lou or to Lou Holtz as the, the, you know, the game was over that this is a tough team. Uh, yeah. Seem, seems like Ohio State, at least in that respect is, is a little bit tougher than last year, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens as, as we go down. I'll just, I feel I feel pretty confident still about Ohio State. I'm Michigan curious still. about Marvin Harrison Jr. affairs going forward. He went, left the game of an injury, uh, came back. wasn't much of a factor in that game, but we'll be interested to see how it, you know, how he heals over the next few weeks. Um, I mean, it, it, I, I would just anticipate him to be healthy by the time they face Penn State. Yeah. you know, Ohio State's best players are always seem like they're always healthy when they play Penn State. So it. But it, it's going to be, you know, everything is uh, lining up that to be a, you know, the the game of the year when they when they meet up at that point. At least so, until Michigan. Well, yeah, at least until Michigan, yeah. For, so, for either team, whoever wins that will then have the biggest game of the year be against Michigan. So. By the we'll way, and, uh, condolences uh, to your uncle uh, Joe Moorhead. Uh, his back losing four overtimes to Indiana well, and. Frankly, could have won in regulation. They had an easy, like, right down the middle field goal. It probably was no longer than like 35 yards, if that. And he just shanks it to the left and it goes to overtime. Um, you know, that's a game that where Akron led for a good chunk of the game and Indiana just made enough plays to, you know, to get back at it and ultimately win in four overtimes. So, uh, Got to, I feel kind of bad for for Hoping has a breakthrough soon at Akron. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that they took Indiana into overtime, not that Indiana is exactly some juggernaut, but to you know get Akron to the point where they're taking Big Ten teams to uh to overtime, I think is you know a good sign. Obviously, Joe, my father, not my uncle, just for the record, he's my dad. But um, I'm sure my dad would like to win that game, but. All in all, good good things ahead for Akron and Akron's offense corner, Billy Fessler, who I have predicted will be Penn State's head coach by the year twenty forty. So <laughs> maybe it was even twenty thirty five. I don't I don't remember what my exact thing was, but either way, future Penn State head coach Billy Fessler doing great, doing great at Akron. Um, just run around the country real quick. Pitt loses again. They move to one and three. They lose to North Carolina forty one <laughs> to twenty four. What a shame for Pat Narduzzi, who I'm sure is still yelling at the fans for being bad. And that's why Pitt is losing. Um, Washington State takes down Oregon State, 38 to 35. And what was the people's main event tonight? You know, Iowa State, Notre Dame, Penn State, Iowa, right? That got the, uh, at least our focus. But true sickos of college football, Oregon State, ranked, ranked Oregon State at ranked Washington State. That was the people's main event. Um, Duke continues to look great. I might continue to bet Duke every single week because they always win. Colorado gets absolutely smacked. It was 42 to 6. And to be honest with you, that doesn't even partly explain what Oregon did to Colorado. Uh, it really should be illegal to beat a team that badly. And 
not great for Colorado and Deion Sanders, although I shouldn't say all that unexpected. Um, Florida State comes from behind and beats Clemson 31 to 24 in overtime, basically just throwing 50 50 balls to their massive wide receivers, which it turns out works. And Rutgers, despite taking a 7 0 lead, loses to Michigan 31 to 7 as the game went along. So exciting day of college football that, you know, had a lot of hype, and I, and I think it met the hype. It was a good day. Yeah, it's definitely the best, you know, the young season still, but definitely the best, most entertaining week we've had so far. Um, Obviously, we got one more come in uh, October or get deeper into, you know, slowing the conference play. And, uh, you know, you're going to start to see uh, the contenders get separated from more uh, drillings on the line. I'm sure we'll get some crazy upsets as well. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Of course, we're excited to see how Penn State continues to develop. You know, with these next three weeks to prepare for Ohio State <laughs> in October. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're staying up late to watch some of the night games, uh, you got USC, Arizona State, Cal and Washington, Kent State, Fresno State going on right now. So got a little after dark action going on there. But uh Pat, you got any final final thoughts, words before we call it a night? No, nope. good. Win 31 nothing. 31 nothing definitely feels better. Breaking 30 the, the 30 mark again, Absolutely. which is 11th game, I want to say 10th game, 11th game, something like yeah, that. It's yeah, you know, what? I, I'm sorry that missed that, missed that fact. Yeah, this is 11th yeah. straight game. Penn State scored 30 or more points, so that streak remains intact. And I'm hopeful that'll be the case against Northwestern and UMass as well. So, uh, yes, uh, but we'll, we'll see. Um, but anyway, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, whether you're watching us on uh, Voice College Football Channel, and if you are, haven't done so already, please like and subscribe to us. Uh, if you're watching Black Your Diaries, uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, so, actually, I will not be doing next week's post game show against Northwestern. Pat will be manning the fort. We'll have a special guest co host in my place. Um, but uh, we're gonna get Drew Allar. We're yeah, it's we're gonna yeah, right. it's gonna be Drew yeah. Allar, guys. For live, live from the field, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we, we got someone who can patch us into Drew. No, I'm kidding. We'll maybe we'll get we'll John Don. John uh, John Donovan is not doing anything. We will get John Don. Probably not. Maybe we can we can probably get him. I'm sure. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, Tim Aiden, Patrick Kerbor, uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and we will see you next week. <laughs>